welcome to my cap office hours. We'll wait a couple minutes or a minute here and let everybody roll in and then we'll get started. Okay, so welcome everybody. You are at MyCap or the CAP office hours. So this is uh, for people that are in the CAP community and some people that aren't that are thinking about joining the CAP community. So this is really every other week we hold this on Mondays at 4 Pacific, 6 Eastern or 7 Eastern, sorry. Um, and this is really an opportunity for you to ask questions, what's on your mind. Um, I have a few things that, that I'm going to share um, that are coming up for people um, that have a rising senior in high school. So I'm going to share some of that stuff because, I, have, you know, we're coming into the busy season here, right? School year is starting for some of you, maybe have already started different parts of the country and in other parts of the country is going to start pretty soon because we're almost to September. Crazy. Um, I am Peg Keo. I am the um, director of education here at College Aid Prep. So I work with parents and advisors and been doing this for a while. So I love doing this. So I am here to support you. Um, if you have questions, um, you'll see Q&A down at the bottom. So feel free to pop your question in. Um, and if you want it to be anonymous, you can mark the box. Um, so nobody will see your name and I won't see it either. Um, so feel free to start popping in any questions. Um, I will share one thing that um, I want parents, especially parents of rising seniors. So why don't you take a minute in the chat and just put the year of graduation of your of your child that your oldest child that's the oldest in high school. Pop that in there um, in the chat and then I can see can get a feel for um, I recognize some of the names, which is awesome. Um, but just pop that in the chat, if you will, just, if you have a rising senior, put 2023, if you have a child that's about to start junior year, 2024, et cetera, et cetera. Cause that just gives me an idea of, um, who's on today. All right, guys, I don't see anybody putting it in the chat. I guess you're putting it. Oh, chat is it. I don't know why chat is always disabled. Thanks for letting me know. Panelists can chat with everyone. It tends to default to that. Attendees can chat. Okay. All right. I've got it um, enabled. Sorry about that, guys. Like I said, for some reason, it seems to default to that. I don't know why. Okay. And let me see. I've got one question here. A couple. Here we go. Um, I have a rising junior, so class 2024. And one who just started college, congrats at Baylor. Um, curious to hear your thoughts on where to apply for merit scholarships this time of year. So I don't know if you're asking for your Baylor child that just started, um, or if you're asking for your rising junior, um, both, okay. Um, that's, that's a very specific question to your kids. So at Baylor, since your child's already there, obviously, um, I would tell your son or daughter to um, to have their eyes and ears open because there are scholarships out there for upperclassmen. And for example, my son, who's now graduated college, but he he picked up money two different times when he was an upperclassman from the business school. He was at Indiana University in the Kelly School of Business. And he went into the office and he said, mom, there's some, there's some scholarships they have. And he got 5,000 bucks and they weren't com super competitive. I mean, he had to apply and he had to, you know, have the initiative to go in. So I would tell your child at Baylor to, if they're in a specific college to go in and ask what opportunities there are for upperclassmen. Um, and, and there very well could be opportunities. My nephew 
got 10,000 bucks from the business school at Syracuse as a sophomore. And I've got other clients that that's happened through the years. So um, just keep that in mind um, for your, for your Baylor child, for your rising junior, that's what it's all about. This planning, that's what it's all about. So if you're hopefully Jason, I'm assuming you're in my cap, right? If you're not in my cap, definitely set up a free account and I can share my screen here. Let me go in and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll pop in here. I'll, uh, this is my cap. This is a dashboard of my sample, my cap, but in here, basically you can go in, I'm going to log out. If you go to this URL and I will put it in the chat for everybody. Go to the MyCap URL, click get started for free. You're gonna make up a username and password. And then the next screen, it'll say, do you wanna go into the free version or the upgrade version, which we call Scholar, or do you wanna book a meeting, which we call Valedictory? And you can just click free version and go through the onboarding and you'll be able to, I'll log back in here so you guys have a visual of this. Um, you'll be able to see your, what we call EFCs, expected family contributions. Um, and if people don't know what that is, just put that in the questions and I can, I can elaborate on that. You're going to get your EFCs. And when you onboard yourself, you're going to be asked for one school. So then you'll have the other one. Basically, you're going to ask your kid's GPA and test scores. If your child hasn't taken tests yet, uh, what I recommend is most kids take the PSAT sometimes sophomore year for practice, and then they'll take it in October of junior year. So your rising junior will be taking those soon, most likely in public school. That's what they do. At least my kids came out of public school and then pop in those scores. If they've done a practice, pop in those scores. You can change them at any time if they take it again and do better. The reason why you want the GPA and test scores in there is we have a merit scholarship database in here. So for example, for Denison, if you go in here to more information, here's all of Denison's merit scholarships. So if you onboard your child, basically we're, if we can select a merit scholarship by lining up GPA and test scores, and that's really dependent on the college and how transparent they are about how they give out merit aid. But if we can auto-click, we will. Even if the software does not auto-click, that's not a problem because you just go in and then you've got all the merit scholarships here and you can quickly see if there are any that are applicable to your child. If you click on them, it goes right to the website with information about the scholarships. So this is really what you want to be doing. I mean, beginning, I just had a parent ask me this in email this morning, like my child's starting junior year in high school. Is it too early to do all this? And I'm like, no, it absolutely is not. You, you want to understand where your child can get discounts if they're need-based or if they're merit-based. Um, you wanna understand that before you start going shopping for college, right? It's just, just like when you go to buy a house, right? You get, you figure out how much you can afford and then you go shopping. Here, you figure out what you can afford, which we'll walk you through in this offer as well. But then also where can you get discounts? Because all the colleges are discounting. It's just a matter of, how they discount. And if your family, based on your financials and based on um, grades, test scores, talent of your child is going to potentially get the merit aid. So hopefully that, that answers your question, Jason. Okay. What else do we have here? Is there a timing restriction with respect to 529 withdrawals for college or K-12 to withdrawals? So for 529, 529s for people that don't know, that's a college savings account that's an, that the IRS created you know, several years ago. So basically you can make contributions in there, they build tax-free and the withdrawals are tax-free as long as you spend the money on what's called qualified higher education expenses. So that's tuition and fees, room and board, books, anything that the college requires. Like now some colleges are requiring a computer. And I think computers, even if the college doesn't require it, 
They've changed that recently. One thing to let you know, airfare is not under the IRS rules considered a qualified education expense. I know that sounds weird <laughs> because of course, flying your child to Syracuse or Ithaca College or wherever is an expense related to college. But right now that's not a qualified education expense. So just keep that in mind. So you're asking the timing restrictions. What you want to do with a 529 is it, you want to pull money out for those qualified education expenses. You can pull out whatever fulfills that requirement. So there's no restriction of you can only use 40,000 a year or something like that. As long as you have the qualified education expenses, you can pull it out and you want to keep a paper trail and you just throw that in your tax file for that year. So remember, there is one rule with the IRS. You want to pull the money out of your 529 in the same tax year that you are paying the bill. So forget about school year. The IRS doesn't really care about school years. You know, they go from like August to May or September to June if the school's on quarters. They don't really care about that. Like you're going to pull money out of a 529. You want to spend it in, in the tax year you pull it. So that's the calendar year. So for example, my daughter, her bill for second semester was due the Friday of the first week of classes, which could be January 13th, for example, right? Well, I shouldn't pull money out of my 529 to pay that bill until January of that year. If I pulled it out in late December, the IRS doesn't like that, right? So, so that it's it's not a restriction, it's just kind of a best practice. So, so just keep that in mind. And it can get a little tricky sometimes if a bill is due very close, you just got to time it. So just, just keep that in mind, but there's no dollar restrictions. K through 12, you know what? I haven't been asked this question in a while, but it's 10, I believe it's $10,000. Um, what I'm not remembering is if it's per year or if it's over, I think it might be per year, but I got to Google that. So you know what, Emily, do me a favor and just send an email to support at collegeapro.com and just say, I, I was talking to Peg on office hours and I asked this question and she's just gonna confirm the answer and just put it in there and they'll sh I'll see it probably, but if I don't, they'll shoot it to me and I'll answer you. Um, it's You can pull 10,000 for K to 12 expenses. Um, I just don't remember if it's a one time or if it's per year. I, I, for, I think it might be per year, but that nuance I can't remember. So that's how that works. Okay. I'm trying to search for best academic colleges for biochem or business where I can get at least 20K merit or I can search for D3 in a certain area, same thing. Um, yeah, that right now in my cap, we do not, you can do a search and you can put in biological sciences, or you can put in business and then you can search for best merit right now. You can't search, um, for athletic and D3 does not give, they do not award money at D3 schools for athletics. So just keep that in mind, but I can show you as long as you're in our scholar plan and scholar is the, the upgrade. So there's a free version and then there's what we call scholar and that costs 149 for, for the year. It's a year subscription. You can pay monthly at $14.99, but it is a year subscription. You, you can't just pop in for two months and then cancel. So it's cheaper to just pay the 149 for the whole year. And if by any chance, if anybody on here is in the free version and you, you just can't afford 149 for a year, you've come up on hard times. If you're on free and reduced lunch at school, um, again, email us at support at collegeapro.com and we will upgrade you for a year, no questions asked. It's on the honor system. So we're, 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 we're just trusting that people are honest, right? We want to help. We don't want to leave anybody behind. So if, if, if that's you, if you've fallen on hard times or 
you just can't afford that, you know, let us know and we'll upgrade you. But, but in any event, what I'm going to show you to answer your question, this is in the upgraded version. So if you're over here along the side and you hit shop for colleges and you scroll down, you're going to see an advanced school search. That's where you can go in and you can put in these filters, whatever you want. So you can, you can search in a given state or you can just leave it open to the whole United States. You can search by size of school, less than 5,005 to 15 or 15 and over. Um, we'll just leave it open. Institution type, um, most people, we just leave that and you're gonna get four-year schools. This is where, to your question, you can put biological and biomedical sciences, and then you can do a second one and put in business. You can't do both at the same time. So say you put in biological and that's, that's what you wanna search for. Make sure you've onboarded yourself and you've got your grades and test scores in there because if you wanna find the best merit, which is what you said in your question, you wanna make sure that you've got your grades and test scores in there so that we can search effectively um, for merit for you. So you hit search for schools. Now you're gonna get all the schools throughout the country that have business. If you wanna find the ones that are gonna offer you the best merit, then you go to sort by and you pick scholarship money. And now what it's gonna do is it's gonna rearrange this list. It's gonna give you schools that have business where you're going to get the most merit, not the schools that offer the best merit in general. It's based on your grades and test scores. That's why it's so important to have it in there. So with my sample family, I have grades and test scores in here. Then you're gonna see. St. Catharines, and then when you click on here, you can see, well, we're projecting for my sample family a $40,700 merit scholarship. So that's the best way to do that. You're gonna, and then if you see a school, it's like, oh, I haven't heard of that school, I wanna check it out. You just click that box and hit add schools and it'll end up on your dashboard. That's all you need to do. See there's St. Catharines, then you can go in, check them out. We're projecting that $40,700 scholarship, right? So that's a huge, that's a very nice net cost for my sample family, right? So that's how you do that, but you need to have the scholar. So if you don't have the scholar and you're in the free version, and this is for anybody who's in the free version, your, your dashboard will say upgrade up here where mine says book expert consultation. This is because I'm in an upgraded version so that I could add more schools to show people. Um, but yours will say upgrade. And when you hit upgrade, you'll get a page and you'll see scholar is the middle option. And you click that, you make payment, and then you'll be able to put in unlimited schools. And you'll also on this page, it'll say advanced school search and you'll be able, you'll be able to access that. Okay. All right. Let's see. Oh, we got a lot of questions now. Great. Um, Okay, so you're a member, so that's great, Jason. So you can get in there and do, do all that. Um, is there any other financial information need to be entered in MICAP other than the parent's income and home equity? Does the EFC calculated mostly depend on only those two numbers? So it's really important if you wanna get an accurate EFC, when you go through the onboarding, you need to answer all the questions. And if for some reason you don't know an answer, then that's fine. You can skip it and finish your onboarding and you can always go in and update it. So let me show you that. Um, because if you don't answer the, you want to answer all the financial questions. So when you're on your dashboard, you can see your EFCs. Up here, you're going to see profile in the top right corner. If you click there, that's where you can update any information. So when you're onboarding, if you're not sure about something, you can guess or fill it in or put zero, but just make a note or remind yourself to come in and, and update it. Like with my sample family, you've got the information about the household, how many kids, what, what year they're graduating, grades and test scores. But to your question that was put in, you want to answer, does the student have any money in their name in non-retirement? So for kids, it's usually checking and savings. There's kids here and there that have trust accounts and they're the beneficiary of them or an custodial account like an UGMA or an UPMA, but usually this number isn't super high. Um, but then for the parents, it's really important. We ask for the gross earnings. So gross earnings, because I've gotten this question, 
just recently, actually, today or yesterday, we're asking for gross earnings. So that's when you get offered a job. They say to you, hey, we want you to come on as our you know, marketing associate and we're offering you 80,000 a year. That's your gross earnings. That's not what comes in your paycheck because we all have to pay Uncle Sam. We pay Social Security and Medicare. We might save for retirement, all that fun stuff, right? But we want your gross earnings here, okay? Not your adjusted gross. You don't need your tax return to find your gross earnings. It's really what you were offered when you were given a job, right? And say, you know, you make $80,000 and the year that they're asking, we're asking about, if you have a, a rising senior, when you do financial aid forms, it's going to be all about the tax year 2021. Um, if you got a bonus in 2021 of $20,000 and you make 80, then you should put 100 here because you know you got a bonus. Don't worry about the taxes that came out. It's the gross earnings. So for each parent, if you're divorced, there'll be slightly different questions here, but same concept. It's gross earnings. The non-retirement savings is very important. And as you're going through the onboarding, there are little question marks in the corner. And I don't know if maybe we should make that bigger or somewhere else because I don't know that everybody's seeing them because they're asking questions that are answered in the little question mark. Um, if you're not sure, you know, you can click on it. Um, but non-retirement, that means no 401k, IRA, Roth IRA is retirement, still an IRA, 403b, those are all retirement vehicles. But anything else should be included here. And then if you own your home, your home equity. So equity means the market value minus your mortgage. And if you have a HELOC, if you have a second mortgage, all of that should come off, right? Because you're going to have to pay that off if you were to sell your home. The other thing to keep in mind about your home is you always want to be honest on financial aid forms, but you don't want to overestimate things. Like this is the one time in your life you want to look as poor as possible while being honest, right? So there are a group of schools that look at your home equity and potentially expect you to tap it to pay for college. So you don't want to value your home at the best price if you stage it and you wait for the perfect, perfect offer. You want it to be pretty much the lowest, honest, defensible market value. And then you can take like 15, 20% off. It's called IRS quick sale, right? Because you're not going to you're not going to get all that money, right? I live in the state of Washington and we pay sales tax like on, like you do on a candy bar on the sale of our home, right? So take that 20% off and, and I'm going on a little tangent, which people that know me, you know, I tend to do this, but hopefully this is, is helpful and supportive. And if you did it wrong, just hop back in your profile. All you do is hit edit. It's not a problem and then hit save and it'll adjust. And you'll see your EFC change if you make sizable changes. So in answer to the question, you definitely need to include non-retirement savings and investments. And that includes your kids' 529s if you own them. If grandma and grandpa own them, you don't put that in here. That's another discussion of how to use them, but it's not, it's not shared on your FAFSA. There's a question on the CSS that asks if other people are gonna contribute. Um, but you don't include it in your investments. One thing that is included in here is if you have other property. So sometimes people have a condo in Maui or they have vacant land or they have a little family cabin that they go to in the woods. Again, that value is part. If it's not in a business, that's part of your investments here. And it's only the equity. So if you have a mortgage on that same thing of what I'm saying about your primary home, because all the schools want to know about that if you have other property. Okay, so that was a bit of a long-winded answer, but I think I, I think I hit that. Okay. Uh, let's say EFC is 53,000. Does that mean college literally asked the student to pay 53 out of 75 tuition um, with 22,000 discount? Okay, so what, what, what that means is what an EFC is defined as is expected family contribution. It's the minimum annual amount that the colleges think you can afford to pay. And most parents are flabbergasted at how high this number is. I've had one parent in all my years that looked at it and thought, okay, I get it. Most people just are shocked. So what the college will do in your example, college costs 75,000. They will, 
when they're figuring out need-based aid eligibility, they will say, we cost 75, this family can afford 53, the difference is 22,000. That's the amount of need you have in that college's eyes. That's what they think. That doesn't mean that they're going to meet 100% of that need. Most colleges cannot afford to do that. The Harvards of the world that are sitting on 40 plus billion in endowment, they can meet 100% of your need, but most schools cannot. So it doesn't mean that you're only going to be on the hook for 53,000. It could be more than 53,000. And also when they meet need, say it is a school that meets full need and your need is 22,000. Most schools are going to give you what's called a subsidized direct student loan as part of meeting your need. Freshman year, that's only $3,500, but be that as it may, I'm trying, my point is it's not all going to be grants and free money from the endowment. Hopefully a lot of it is, but all of it most likely will not be. There's also something called work study, and that's what it sounds like. Your child goes to school, has to apply for a work study job, and they actually get a paycheck. And then that can be used to pay for books and tuition, et cetera, right? So that can be part of that $22,000. So just keep that in mind. Um, certain schools meet 100% of need. And in my cap, we have all that information in there for you. So let me uh, let me show you where that is, because we've We've really uh, tried super hard to have all of this information right at your fingertips. So when you're looking at a school, let's just click on more information for Denison. You scroll down here, oops, scrolled a little fast there. Um, in the financial aid area, you can see how much need they meet. So Denison, you know, pretty much meets 100% of need, right? This is self-reported by the colleges, right? There's no regulatory body, body that checks these numbers, but you know it's what the college releases. Then the other number is the percent of kids that get merit. So that's the non-need base. So that's another big number for a lot of families. So again, for Denison, they'll meet 100% of that 22,000, but not all of it is gonna necessarily be grants unless it's a school that's what, what we call a no loan school. And those again, tend to be like the Princetons of the world that have really big endowments. They might not give those direct federal loans. They might give you their grant money in lieu of that. But some of those schools actually do award work study because they expect the student to have some skin in the game. So hopefully that helps. That's that's how um, that's why you're submitting these financial aid forms, right? So that they can calculate these EFCs. Okay, are the list of merit scholarships given out by the colleges shown in the app automatic, or do we have to apply to each of them? That's a great question. Most merit scholarships are. They're not, they're not automatic in that the, the college says this grade and this test score, you automatically get it. Some schools do do that, like University of Alabama, for example. If you, look, if you Google it, I was just on their site answering a question a week ago. It'll say, if you have this test score, you get this. You don't need to do anything, but most merit scholarships you don't need to apply for. That being said, there are some you do. And we will tell you that, again, in my cap, when you're looking, let me go back in here. When you're looking at a school, and I don't know if Denison has any automatic scholarships, we will tell you if it's automatic with grades and test scores. But when you click on these links, it, it might tell you if an extra application or interview or something is required. What I would say is some schools have big merit scholarships, like for example, Emory has one and it requires, I don't know if it's a separate app, but there's recommendations, there's an interview process and it's like full tuition, you know, those ones they typically do require the student to do something. They're just not automatically considered. And in our app, you will almost always see those at the top of the list and they will pop out to you because they will say $50,000. They'll be worth a lot more than a lot of the other scholarships that you're gonna see. So in answer to your question, most 
of the merit scholarships you're not doing a separate application for, but some schools, there are some big ones that you do. So you wanna just stay on top of it. Um, as I said, most of them don't have a separate application, but they might have a deadline. So they might say, you are automatically considered for our merit scholarships as long as you apply for admission by December 1, for example, right? So not to go off, because I know we have a lot of questions. So I'll just quickly tell you, there's three basic ways to apply for admission. There's early decision, early action, and regular admission. So early decision is binding, meaning you better know if you can afford it because the only way you can get out of it is you can't. You guys are all on these office hours. You can figure out if you can afford it without a doubt. Book an hour with one of our experts. Know if you can afford it before you apply early decision. Um, early action is an earlier deadline, but it's not binding. I really like early action personally. One of the reasons is tied into my answer to your question is that it has an earlier deadline for the application for admission. And so most of the time, if you're applying early action, you've probably met a deadline to be automatically considered for merit aid. So I would really, some schools don't have early action. So you'll notice if they don't, they don't. If they just have early decision and regular admission and they offer merit scholarships, they might not have a deadline that says early, but that's something to stay on top of. If they, if they have a deadline to be automatically considered, you want to meet that deadline, especially if you have a, if you have a child who, uh, who's a good student who's eligible for merit aid at a given school you're looking at. Okay. We have a valedictorian account. We are trying to figure out what financial information we should enter given that our current financial situation is a third of the income of what it shows on our 2021 tax return. We want to get an accurate picture of the EFC. Okay. So what I would do is I would enter 2021. And I don't know if you have a rising senior, if you have a, if you have a class of 2023 student, I'm guessing you do, child, because you're talking about 2021. So what I, what I recommend you do is answer the questions as if it was 2021, and then get that all dialed in, spend some time in my cap, get all your questions together, and then have your data ready because I would tell the person exactly what you're saying in this question. Hey, what do we do? Because we'll submit that FAFSA and CSS with those numbers, but our current reality is really different, okay? And, and, and that's grounds for appeal, basically, if your 2021 situation is... is is much worse than now because realize you're going to be filling out financial aid forms for your child. They're going to go live October 1 in a couple months, a one almost one month now, right? You're going to fill those out and then you're going to appeal and 2022 is almost going to be over, right? And so you're going to be able to reach out to the college and appeal. So I'm, I'm very happy that you have valedictorian so that you can talk to one of our college planning experts. They will all be able to advise you very, very well about how to handle that. So that's how I would fill in your information, but definitely have your new income estimates for that meeting so that you don't waste time going to get it while you're paying for that hour. So that's that's what I would do to maximize um, maximize that. And that person can go in with you and you can make adjustments to the profile numbers. And then you can see, well, if we appeal and we successfully appeal, how would that change our EFC? And now how would that change potential need-based aid and that sort of thing? So it's really good, very good to have a meeting booked. Another 529 question. Is there a limit on how much I can put into and remove from the account? There is a limit, but it's very high for 529s. I think most of them are over 200,000, you know, accumulated over, you know, over years of contributing. Um, so that's pretty high. Removing, no. I, I, I touched on that earlier. As long as you have qualified education expenses, um, as long as you don't want to get a penalty and pay tax on the earnings, you can pull that out. If your child's going to a school that costs $85,000 and you have documentation that you spent $85,000 on qualified education expenses, you can pull $85,000 out. But as I said earlier, make sure you pull it out as you're in the tax year, you're spending it. So if you buy books on December 31st, 
um, of 20, whatever, right? Don't pull that money out on January 2nd to pay for the books. You want to pull it. You want to do your distribution in the year that you, um, you want to pay for it in the year you pull the distribution. So that's how that works. So paper trail is super important. Like with my kids, um, like if they bought books, like I, I kept the receipts. Um, if they bought them on Amazon, you know, print out that invoice, just throw it in your tax file. So you've got proof and it gets a little trickier when they're upperclassmen and they move off campus because freshman year, you've got that bursar bill and you're paying for the dorm and you're paying for the meal plan, you're paying tuition. But when they move off campus, then you have leases. So I put my lease in the tax file. I had proof of everything I spent. So um, you just want to, in case you get audited, right? You just want to have a paper trail to prove that you followed the rules. Um, okay, another question. Can I pull the money out and put it right back in the next day to allow it to keep growing if I was able to cash flow the original charge? Um, yeah, I mean, you can pull money out. Say you pull 20, 15,000 out to pay for tuition. You can pull the 15,000 out. As long as you paid tuition of $15,000, you've, you've covered your requirements. So you won't have to pay tax on the earnings on that or a penalty. Um, if you want to take that money then because you didn't really need to pull it out and put it back in, you can do that. Or you can just leave it in, right? You can just leave it in and let it continue to grow. If you can pay through cash flow, you just want to make sure that you use it all. If you don't use it all, you can change the beneficiary. So you can do that. But if you've got the money through cash flow, you can just leave it there. But you, you know, if you have an only child and you have nobody to change the beneficiary, you want to make sure you spend it down by the time your child finishes college or else you can pull it out but you're gonna pay tax on the earnings and a 10% penalty. Okay. I am getting way too many searches. I do have Scholar. I don't know what that means. I'm getting way too many searches. I'm not sure. You're gonna to have to elaborate. I, I don't know what that comment means. So if you could elaborate, that would be great. Um, does 529 plan amount count as at 5% on the FAFSA form, just like parental assets count. So if, yeah, assets, parental assets that are non-retirement are assessed up to 5.64% after allowances. So on the FAFSA, it's it's 5.64 after the asset protection allowance, which is not very generous. On the CSS profile, um, it's actually assessed at 5% after their allowances. And the CSS profile institutional methodology is what we call it. They have much more generous allowances. They have one, they're assuming you've saved for college for your child. So if you have three kids, they pull that off. They know you want to retire someday. So they pull some money off for that too. But it's assessed a five to nine as long as the parent is the owner. So there's an owner of a 529 and a beneficiary. So the student, your child, this is the beneficiary, right? Because that's what you're saving for. Most of the time, the parent, one of the parents is the owner. As long as the parent is the owner, yes, that is part of your non-retirement assets. And it's all of your 529 accounts, not just the 529 for the student that's about to go to college, right? So sometimes I've had people that are really good savers, right? They might have three accounts with 100,000 each for their kids. Technically, they've got to put 300,000 in there. That is something that you can appeal and share with the college. Hey, I followed the rules, but some of this money is not for the student. And you can show documentation through registration on a from the account, your 529 account. But yes, that is, a, that is considered when you're onboarding into MyCap, that's part of the parent non-retirement as long as the parent is the owner, the 529. In College Aid Pro, can out-of-state tuition offsets, offsets discount be combined with merit awards or do they get the higher of the two? So that out-of-state offset, we're in the process of probably removing that. Our lead data scientist, Wendy Nelson, that's in there to let you guys know that some, some states 
have agreements, you know, like in the Northeast, I'm not 100% familiar with all the nuances of them. I think even in the Midwest, it's Illinois and Indiana. Like if you're a resident of a certain state, say it's Indiana, Illinois schools might give Indiana kids in-state tuition. That's what that's in there. You have to know that that's the case. So if you click on that, um, you're going to have to check with those specific states. Like merit, merit aid is offered by the Office of Admissions. And it's basically starting that discounting process that I talked about at the beginning, right? They don't care about your ability to pay. They're just, they want the student. They see the student, the student has applied, they see the grades and test scores, and that's a kid they want to start enticing to come to the school. So they're starting the discounting process. So I can't answer that question to say every school is going to handle it this way. One, that out-of-state offset has to be applicable. If it's in there, that doesn't mean it's applicable to your family. More likely than not, it's not applicable. That's why we're thinking of taking that out because it's causing a lot of confusion. People see it there and think, oh, actually, I'm just going to make a note of that to find out for sure what we're doing with that um, with Wendy. Um, so if you get that and then merit is awarded that you, you got to ask the school, I would think the school would still give merit, right? Because they're not giving, the merit is based on wanting the students, not based on any sort of economic formula. It's not based on EFC, right? And it's always, almost always offered for four years. You have to read the fine print, but student maintains a GPA. So that's a wonderful thing for planning. Um, want the best academics with some merit. I am getting tons of schools that are less than what my son would qualify for. Well, you can, uh, let me look, let me go in here. Thank you for clarifying. Um, let me go look in the advanced search. Yeah, in the advanced search filters right now, you know what you can do about that? If you are, you can go into the Forbes ranking and um, you can pick top 10, top 50, if you're interested in that and you won't get some of the schools that you're asking about. So that that's what I would recommend you do. Use that filter, use the Forbes ranking filter. I'm not a huge fan of rankings, but that will, that should help you because that'll get rid of probably some of the schools that you're that you're looking at that you don't want to show up. Um, I would be careful with rankings in general. I'm just saying to the whole audience, um, be very careful. Uh, the merit scholarship award amount that is shown in the tool for a particular college for a son, does that take into account any way the essay? Yes, it absolutely does. If it's if we chose one in the software, that's based on what the college has said, how they award merit scholarships, it's not a generic number. If we've clicked it, that means that we're projecting that your son is going to get that merit award. And I would look in there, click on the merit award, look at what it says in the little carrot. If you click on the actual award, it should go to the website. You can read a little bit more about it. We're projecting. Some schools are very transparent about how they award merit aid, and then some schools are not, right? Um, we're we're going to be developing, you know, potentially a, a transparency grade, not to be mean to the colleges, but just to kind of actually, you know, give kudos to the colleges that are more transparent because that helps us help you. That helps you guys plan, right? So no, it is absolutely not generic. It is for your son specifically. Um, do schools take into account private college costs for siblings not in college? On the CSS profile, which is the second financial aid form that about 300 schools, mostly private, require, they ask if you are paying tuition, and they do take that into account. On the FAFSA, they do not, but that does not mean that you can't share that with the colleges. If you're paying sizable tuition for younger kids that are in middle school, grade school, whatever, high school, you should disclose that to the college. And and some they, they all have their own things and what they're going to take into account, but that's that's something you should you can you can share. But on the CSS, they ask you, so it, it will definitely be shared on the FAFSA. You're going to have to proactively share it. What is your recommendation for what to do with money that is being given now by grandparents? Should should they put it into into a five two nine? 
but with college coming in a year, is it best to just leave it in a savings account? Any other options or suggestions? Well, um, they can they can give it to you and put it in your 529 if you have a 529, but then that's going to be something you're going to have to share as an asset on your on the FAFSA and CSS. Um, they can just leave it if if your child is close to going to college. The big positive of a 529, there's a few of them. You get tax deferred growth and you don't pay tax on the earnings when you pull it out. And if you're in a state that gives a state tax deduction on your state income taxes, those are the big perks of a 529. So if the grandparents, if they're about to spend this not too long from now, you're not going to get a lot of tax deferred growth because you're not going to have it in the account that long, right? So you know, if you have a kindergartner, it's great. You put it in there and it grows and grows and grows and nobody ever pays tax on it unless the laws change, unless the IRS changes how things work or Congress does. So if it if it's if it's going to be put in there for a year, you can do it. Um, some schools will specifically ask on the CSS, is anybody, is there a 529 account for this student? So that's a, it's kind of a loaded question, and I can't 100% answer it for you specifically because I don't know your EFCs, and it depends. It depends. If you have no need-based aid eligibility, then it, it doesn't really matter, right? They can, they can save whatever they want, and if that hurts your EFC, you don't have any need just based on your situation. If you have need-based eligibility, you, you might want to think about how you do it. Um, because grandparents that pull money out, at least for the next year, it's going to change. That can adversely affect an EFC, but that is going to change in the 24-25 school year. So um, I can't really tell, I, I, you know, this isn't a forum where I'm going to suggest that people go into certain investments. That's not really what I can do here, but hopefully that helps. Hopefully that helps. That's you know, you can, the, the biggest negative of a 529 is that, like I said earlier, it has to be used for qualified education expenses. So once it's in there, you can't say, oh, you know, we want to use it to pay for airfare or it wants to go to Europe or something. You can't do that. You can, but you're going to have to pay tax on the earnings and, uh, and a penalty, um, 10% penalty. So that's the downside of a 529. So if it's not going to be in there very long, you're not going to have a lot of the tax deferred growth. I don't know how much money is being invested. I, I don't have enough details to adequately fully answer it, but hopefully that helps. Okay. Is the tax assessor's estimate of the FERT legit? Um, eh. It, it has to be defensible in my mind. You're going to have people to tell you, yeah, that's legit. I mean, I, I am honest in everything I do in my life, right? Even if it's if it's going to hurt me, right? If, if I'm paying too much for somebody gives me the wrong change, I give it back, right? So you're going to get different answers depending on who you ask about that. If your tax assessed value is absurdly low, the colleges aren't stupid, right? You're going to be giving your zip code and they're going to, they, they can do their homework, right? Um, so it, it depends. Like my tax value is growing very fast in the Seattle area. So that could very well be a defensible number, right? But in certain parts of the country, that just might be a super low number. And if you know houses are selling for 200,000 more than that, because um, different places I've lived, that number has been much lower than the comps of how things are selling. So you kind of got to play it by ear. Like I said, you want to be honest, but you don't want to overestimate and definitely keep that IRS quick sale value in mind. What is the truth about optional SAT? My child has a great GPA and an average SAT 1250. Not sure whether to show SAT or will the school hold it against her, assuming it was low. Um, that really depends on the college. And if you are working with a counselor, um, an independent outside counselor, or if you can, you're, you can ask the counselor that your child is working with at their school, if it's a public school and it's a big public school like my kids, you know, those those counselors, that's not part of their job to sit down and help your child build a college list and know every school in the country like the independent counselors do. Um, so that really depends. At certain schools, a 1250 could really help your child get um, get in and get merit aid, right? But at other schools, 
a 1250, you, you might not want to submit. So it's not, um, it's not one answer across the board. You don't have to submit your SAT to every school, right? You can choose where you submit. So if it's going to be advantageous at one school, definitely submit it. And if not at others, don't. That, that would be my advice as far as specific schools. And I will show you here in my cap. I will show you where you can see some data that might help with that. Um, if you go into a given school under the admissions tab here, it says the middle 50% that were accepted, right? So if your daughter's test scores are right in there or they're higher than this, then that in my mind, and I'm, I'm not an admission counselor, so I, I don't wanna overstep into out of my sweet spot here, but um, if the average SATs were 1100, your daughter's got a 1250, well, I'd definitely be submitting them, right? Because that shows she's higher than the middle 50%. If she's much lower, like some schools, if the average kid's getting 1,400, no, that wouldn't make sense for her, right? But optional, test optional, we all know what optional means, right? It's optional, but that that doesn't mean they're not looking at it for kids that submit it. So um, just keep that in mind. So hopefully that helps. Let's see here. If you're divorced and ex-spouse is not going to contribute anything or cooperate, do I have to enter only my information? Okay. So if you are divorced, the current rules are only one parent submits this and it's the custodial parent with the student. So the definition of the custodial parent for this coming year, it's going to change, but for this coming year, um, if you're submitting that FAFSA, it, your, your child's going to school in 2023, 2024 is what I mean by this coming year, right? Not 22, 23. I mean, you've got a rising senior sort of thing. It's the custodial parent, and that is defined as the parent where the child has spent the most time on a year look back. So literally, when you are hitting submit on those financial aid forms, if you submit them October 15th, November 1st, whenever you're hitting submit, it's a year look back. Where did your child spend the most time? So a lot of people are 50-50 custody. Um, so there's a decision there. But in your situation, if your ex is not going to cooperate, um, that it, it on the FAFSA, if your child lives with you more, this person that just asked me this question, you're the custodial parent, they don't need to cooperate. They are not involved in this process at all. That's perfect. If your child is, lives with your ex-spouse more, that's going to be a problem because that parent is the custodial parent and your ex-spouse is going to need to submit it with, with your child. The CSS profile, both parents submit. So if your ex-spouse is not willing to cooperate and fill out the CSS profile, that could be a problem. And, you know, parents that, families that are divorced and separated, there's a lot of nuances there. And that is, I, I do recommend most families in that situation to book an hour with one of our experts. So you have your ducks in a row and you know what you're doing. It's, it, it can get pretty confusing and there can be, it can be hard, right? You've got two families and depending on if you get along or not. Okay, uh, we got six minutes. I'm gonna get through all of these. Oh, one of these is just a thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for thanking me. Okay, tons of colleges are coming up in the search and many are not very high, just looking for, I, I answer this. So what you wanna do is in that, in the advanced search, you want to use the Forbes filter, right? So when you go in here, let me get rid of uh, the chat, the questions for a minute. Go into advanced search and pick, go into Forbes. You can pick top 10. You're only going to, that's only 10 schools. You're going to really limit it to for, what Forbes thinks are the best top 10 schools. Top 50, top 100. That should help narrow it down. If you're not seeing schools, that seem like they're a good academic fit. So that's that's my suggestion there. And that, that should work, it should work very well. Um, I didn't get any financial aid for my college freshman and no other kids in college next year. My income has gone up this year. I don't see any reason to file the FAFSA again, but everyone says I should. Do you agree with me or everyone else? Um, I agree with everyone else, Jason. I, I really encourage you to submit the FAFSA um, every year for a bunch of reasons. One, it's free. That's not the main reason, but as you know, you've been through this process. There's almost nothing else that's free. 
Two, things can change, right? Your life can change. COVID really taught all of us that, right? Things can change almost overnight, right? So if you have that on file, that helps. I don't know what you're doing with the, your, your child at Baylor. If you're taking advantage of direct loans, unsubsidized loans, if you don't submit the FAFSA, you're not, you are not eligible for them. Um, your child isn't getting merit aid, but some schools require it for merit aid, which makes no sense because it's not a merit form, but just so you know for your next child coming up. So your EFC will most likely go up, but I, when I had my two in school, I wasn't getting need-based aid. I submitted it every year. I just, just had it on file. Once you're used to doing it, it's not too hard. Um, th that's what I recommend. Also, if you ever want to appeal anything, colleges will look, they'll see if you took the student loans, did you submit the FAFSA? So I, I do recommend you submit it. Okay, the SAT range is what two numbers? Uh, that's the middle 50%. I think what you're talking about, let me go back in here. If we click, so I'm sharing here, if we click on a school and we go, going too fast, go to admissions. I think what you're asking here, this is the middle 50%, right? So yeah, there's, you've got the kids that did worse and the kids that did better. So that's what those numbers are. That's what those numbers are. The middle 50%. Okay. Yes, I had tried to qualify. Thanks. Not totally sure what that means, but I'm glad you're I'm glad you're done and you're happy. Okay. All right. We got a few more minutes in college applications and their admission decisions. Do they factor in whether you indicated applying slash looking for financial aid? So I know what you're you're referencing there, I think it might even be on the common app where it says, are you applying for financial aid? I would not overthink this, right? Um, if you are applying for financial aid, just mark yes and move on. Is that gonna affect some admission decisions? It might, right? If schools are what's called need blind, and I don't really know if any schools truly are, but there are schools that say they're need blind, meaning they do not have any idea about your ability to pay when they accept you. Most schools are not need blind. Some schools might say they're need aware. And so what that means is they can see your ability to pay. So basically, um, what when I've talked to financial aid offices, this is what they tell me. We're creating a class. They accept people that are Pell Grant eligible, meaning their EFCs are pretty low, like less than $7,000, right? They gladly accept those kids they're trying to be inclusive, right? But they can't have a class of all Pell Grant kids because they're draining their endowment. I mean, Harvard could, because they could afford it, but you know, kidding here, right? Most schools can't afford it, right? So what, what I've had officials tell me, administrators at the colleges, hey, when we're finishing up filling up our class, the last 10%, 15%, if we're looking at two kids and one kid we're going to have to give a lot of need-based aid to, and another kid, not much or not any. We might, and they're same, that we want them equally for the academics and the, the, the person that they are, their character, all that stuff. We might take the full pay, what we call full pay family, right? Because we know we don't have to give endowment money, but most schools, they're not looking at that with every admission decision. And the bottom line is you have to find schools that are affordable. So if you're not going to apply for financial aid, be ready to write a full check because you can't say I'm not looking for financial aid and then your child gets in and you come back and say, oh yeah, now I want it. I've, I've talked to administrators that when families do that, they say no can do. You said you weren't going to get, you needed financial aid. You didn't apply. So now you're out of luck. So you really want to do your due diligence, figure out what's affordable. You know, there's academic, personal, and financial fit. And every kid can find schools where they can thrive. And all three of those can be met. I do this for a living, obviously. And so um, I did it with my two. They went to Indiana University and James Madison University. You might not have even heard of James Madison University. My daughter had an exceptional experience. 
she's a social worker, went and got her master's, supporting herself, having a great life, right? So it is possible. I just, I'm doing a little soapbox on that because I don't want you to get hung up on these name brand schools exclusively and, oh, should I not apply for financial aid? Because you could get yourself in financial hot water for your family very quickly. So, um, they, but I, but I did answer your question, how they look at it. Some schools don't, a lot of schools do, but if you're applying for financial aid, just be honest and say, yeah, if you're submitting the FAFSA to get unsubsidized student loans and you have a very high EFC, then say no, because you're not applying for, you're not submitting the FAFSA to get need-based grants because you, you're you not going to get them. So just don't, don't overthink it. Don't get too stressed about it. Thank you for your time. You're very welcome. All right. I got one more question and then we're going to hop off. My child is not getting financial aid, but is getting pretty substantial merit aid. My fear with reapplying to the FAFSA is that they'll think we can afford more and might remove the merit aid. You need to read the fine print, but merit aid is offered by the Office of Admissions. It's almost always offered for four years, guaranteed as long as the student maintains um, a certain GPA, and it's not usually a 4.0. It's They just want to make sure the kids are doing well academically if they're giving them merit aid. So you can call the school anonymously if that makes you feel better and ask them that question, but knock on wood, I've been doing this for over a decade. I've never seen a college. Only time a college has ever rescinded merit aid is when the student is struggling academically and they've got a 2.8 or they're, they're below the GPA requirement, right? You got to remember, Office of Admissions offered your child that money because they wanted your child. They did not care if you had Bill Gates income or you were unemployed. They were willing to, you know what? They were willing to give their endowment money away. So kudos to your child, right? Great. Okay. All right. You're very welcome. And wow, you guys... Thank you for all the wonderful questions. This was great. And hopefully people that didn't even ask questions learned a lot. That's another big, um, that's another huge perk of office hours that uh, you can hear everybody else's questions and and keep learning, learning, learning. And, you know, keep keep an eye on your emails. You're gonna, we're gonna be doing webinars coming up about the, the forms and a lot of good stuff coming in the CAP community. All right, guys, everybody have a great night.